Okay, so how is everyone today? Good, I hope. Okay, so um, there's a quiz this week. Uh, remember that this, the the written homeworks corresponding to this week's quiz, we, we didn't turn those in, but they're still available to you, and the keys are posted and all that. So there's that. Then there this morning, several more written homeworks were posted. Um, and they're due on Monday. And next week's quiz is over those written homeworks. Good. And then now, from, from, from now on, we'll be able to space them out like we were before. <coughs> any questions about any of that? OK. So last time, <coughs> when we left, uh, we were talking about equations. So let's, let's uh, review that. <coughs> So for example, this equation, 3x equal 12. <clears throat> so the name, the name for such an equation is, this is referred to as an equation. Equation in one variable. Equation one variable, and among the interesting things you can do with such equations is you can substitute values in. So, for example, we could substitute the value, uh, say x is equal to four. And when we do that, we obtain new equation that says 3 multiplied by 4 equal 12. And if we evaluate the arithmetic on the left hand side that says 12 equal 12. <coughs> so concerning that 12 equal 12, is it an equation? Yes. What is its logical value? True. Okay. <coughs> Terrific. So well, we substituted in 4. What if we substitute in, say, uh, 10? OK. That's a legitimate operation. So then we would get 3 multiply 10 equal uh, 12. The new left-hand side is 30, <coughs> and then equal 12. Is that an equation? Mm -hmm. Yes. What is its logical value? False. So 30 equal to 12. I know that it, it's very likely that your, your, your history of learning math, you have just a slight discomfort at looking at 30 equal 12. <laughs> it is nevertheless an equation. Its logical value is false. Okay. There's nothing immoral or unethical about it. Now, the set of all inputs which <coughs> when substituted into uh, the equation yields an equation which is logically true is called the solution. Okay. So using that language, <coughs> using that language, uh, the way you would say is that 4 is part of the solution. 10 is not part of the solution. Okay, if you look at the notes from last time, then I used a different equation. I think I used something like x squared is equal to 16 or something. I don't know. In such a case, 
if it was x squared equal to 16, then 4 would be part of the solution, and so would negative 4. Okay. So one of the things that we're going to do in, in this class and generally in math and science like this is, you, is one way or another, you want to come up with an equation in one variable, and then you want to find, all, you want to find the solution. That's what you want to do. Find all the values so that when you plug those in, those values in, you get an equation which is true. Okay. So we can have a different situation. Now we could have, say, y is equal to 3x. This, too, is an equation. But we're not going to call it an equation in one variable. Why not? It's more than one variable. It's more than one variable. <laughs> Anyone care to take a stab as to what we might call this? An equation in two variables. <laughs> Mathematicians are notorious for <laughs> this kind of thing. OK. Now, similarly to the previous scenario, we can plug things in, but different from the previous scenario is that we can plug in multiple things. So, for example, for this one, we could substitute in, say, xy equal 3, 9. Which is to say that I want you to take that equation and everywhere you find a you find an x, I want you to plug in three, and everywhere you find a y, I want you to plug in nine. When we do this, we get the equation nine equal three multiply three. Of course three multiplied by three is nine. So notice that when you plug in the the point. 3, 9, you obtain an equation which is logically true. So can someone tell us a point that you can plug in which will result in an equation which is logically false? What can we plug in and get a false equation? 10 and 5. 10 and 5. Okay. So if we substitute xy equal 10, 5, <coughs> Then we would get what? 5 <coughs> equal 3 multiply 10, so that we have 5 equal 30. Okay. Terrific. So some, some of the things we plug in, some of the points we plug in result in an equation which is logically true. Other points that we plug in result in an equation which is logically false. So I won't write anymore, but I'll ask again. Could someone tell us a different point besides the one that I offered that when you plug in, you obtain an equation which is logically true? 4, 12. Okay. X is 4. Then the product 3 and 4 would be 12. And you said this one would be 12, so that would work. How about 0, 0? Oh, that one's pretty good. Okay, so then do you observe that there's a multitude of things we could plug in? Okay. <coughs> Now, you might hope, for the sake of consistency, that if, if this, the set of all points that yield logical truth, is called the solution for an equation in one variable, you might hope that that's also the case here for an equation in two variables. But it's not. For reasons historical, the set of all points that, would, that you can plug into an equation in two variables such that the resulting equation yields logical truth. By the way, that's a mouthful, isn't it? What's going to be the name for that set? It's called, not the solution, not that. That's the set of all values that can be plugged in at all and yield anything. <laughs> so the set of all points that you can plug in and obtain, plug into an equation in two variables and obtain an equation which logically evaluates to truth, that's called the graph. That's its name. 
for the set of all points. X, Y, <clears throat> which, when plugged in, or when substituted in, the equation <clears throat> yields an equation which is logically true. called the graph. It would be nice if both of these were the same, because they're obviously analogous to each other, but it's not the case, <laughs> for reasons historical. Okay, so also we're going to be very, in, in math class and in science, you'll be very interested in taking some situation and then reducing it to an equation in two variables and then considering what things are in the graph. Okay. So any question about these definitions? Notably, as a matter of foreshadowing, something to come in about five minutes, this is called the graph. The graph is a set. Notably, graph has nothing whatsoever to do with a picture which may be contrary to your previous experience okay <clears throat> I'll explain to you why that's the case so now let's consider this example So consider the equation y is equal to 2x minus 3. So in the first place, is this an equation in one variable or an equation in two variables? Two. two. Okay, first question. Is the point x, y equal to um, say uh, 5, 8 in the graph. So how do you confirm or deny this? Plug it in. Plug it in, right? Which is to say, everywhere that you <coughs> see x replaced with 5, everywhere that you see y, Replace with 8. So then we obtain the equation 8 equal 2 multiply 5 minus 3. And so now, evaluating the right hand side arithmetic, we get 2 times 5 is 10, minus 3 is 7. We obtain the equation 8 equal 7. So in the first place, is that an equation? Yes. Yes. What is its logical value? Yes. False. And what bearing does that have on the question that I asked? Yeah. As a result, the response is it is that the point in question is not in the graph. <clears throat> okay. Then I could ask, well, how about is the point x, y equal to 4, 5 <coughs> in the graph. How do you confirm or deny this? Same way as last time, right? <coughs> okay. So 5 equal 2 multiply 4 minus 3. 
Well, 2 times 4 is 8, minus 3 is 5, so we obtain the equation 5 equal 5. Is 5 equal 5 an equation? Yes. Yes. What is its logical value? True. True. And what bearing does that have on my question? So, yes, it is in the graph. So now, in principle, I could go on to ask, you know, about 48 more points, and we could, we could do that. But I think you, you get it, and we don't need to do that. Okay? So now, let's take a slightly different tack. <coughs> and what I want you to do is I want you to construct the, uh, a table. Of values. So how about negative two, negative three, uh, no, negative one, uh, zero, So what I want you to do, what I'm prompting you to do, is that I want you to tell me the y value that would be necessary so that the resulting xy pair, the xy point, would be in the graph. Okay. So for those of you that are seeing this for the first time, I'll help you with one and, and do this one, which is to say, that, okay, if, if x was 4, if x was 4 in this equation, what would be the y value necessary to make the equation true? Well, 2 times 4, that's 8, minus 3 is 5. So if x is 4, the, the right-hand side is 5, so what must y be? 5. So what I want you to do is I want you to fill in the rest of the y values. <clears throat> okay. So moving to the left, if we plug in, if x is 3, what must y be? Uh, also 3, right? Because 2 times 3 is 6, minus 3 is 3, okay? Again, moving to the left, this would be 1, and then this would be negative 1. So what's the pattern here, by the way? 5, 3, 1, negative 1. Yeah, every time we move to the left, we subtract 2. So negative 3, negative 5 negative 7. Terrific. Any question about this table? Okay. Now, I want you to plot <coughs> everything in this table. Which is to say, I want an axis and I want you to draw all those points. So I cheat a little bit and bring these. Okay. So we want to plot these points. So for example, this one right here. We want to plot the point x is 2, y is 1. <coughs> In which quadrant is the point 2, 1? First quadrant, for those of you that know the quadrants by number. Uh, how about using the, the, the terms top left, bottom right, and all of that? 
uh, in which quadrant is the point two one? Top right. So x is two, y is one. That means from the origin, from the origin, travel to the right two, and then up one. So here's the point. Two one. Okay, and now I want you to do it for all these points. So notably, the pattern, if you were able to observe it, is helpful here because every time you move to the right one, the, the y value goes up by two, which means that from this point, if you were to move to the right one, then you'd have to go up two. So plotting all these points, Carefully, here's the point three three. Here's the point four five. Moving to the left, here's the point one negative one. Zero negative three. <coughs> and then no the f further points, that last one won't fit on my on my paper anyway. Okay. So any question about these, these points that we've plotted? So one thing I'd like for you to observe is that it's not always true in, in every single conceivable case, but in this particular case, it is a fact that all of these fall on a straight line. <coughs> they all fall on a straight line, which, which leads me to wonder, well, would any point on that line work? Let's let's imagine here. So, so if this is a straight line, then that point right there that I just marked should be on it. Well, let's read the the axis and read that point's coordinates. What are that point's coordinates? So, how far is it to the right? Two and a half. And how far is it up? Two. Two. Well, let's ignore that just for a moment or pretend that we don't see it. And I'm going to put another point right here. How about 2.5? And ignore this for a moment. What value goes in the table? Two. Two. Right? Because if x is two and a half, then that's two times two and a half, which is five, minus three is two. Two and a half, two. Okay. So then running with that a little bit, I could I could say, well, just like I was at the the red lobster with one of the child menus. Okay. I'm going to do it. I'm going to connect the dots. I know you all know what I'm talking about. You're never too old. Okay. Interesting. So, at this point we've plotted seven points. And what I'm telling you, what I'm telling you is we've plotted seven points. If we were to extend that table further to the right and plot seven million points, then this is what we would see. This is what we would see. <clears throat> okay, so now this drawing, this drawing, is called a plot. So now, <clears throat> We have two different words here that to now may have been synonyms to you. And that is that we have this word graph, we have the word graph, and we have the word plot. And they may be synonyms to you, but I'm telling you right now they're not the same. A graph, a graph is the set of all points which you can plug into an equation in two variables and obtain a logically true equation. Whereas a plot is a drawing of the same. So now, to make the distinction clear, clearer I hope, 
I could ask question five. I could say, okay, please plot the point one four. So plot the point one four, and then I'll ask, is this point in the graph? <coughs> so in which quadrant is point one four? Top right, quadrant one. So it is, you move to the right, one, and then up four. Here's point one four. And that's the point one four. So we plotted it. And then my question to you is, is, is it in the graph? Okay. Why do you say no? Because um, it's on that picture, but that picture is not the graph. Right. So, so now we could ignore the picture for a minute. Just ignore it. And remember, five minutes ago, I was asking if points were in graphs. And what were we doing five minutes ago? Yeah, we were calculating. We were plugging things in. If you were to plug in the if you were to plug in x is 1 and y is 4 into here, then the equation would read 4 equal negative 1. <coughs> what is the logical value of the equation 4 equal negative 1? False. False. So ignoring the picture and only looking at the calculation, the answer to the question is, is 1 comma 4 in the graph? The answer is no from a calculation point of view. From a picture point of view, it's equivalent to asking, well, here I've got this, I've got the plot here. Is that point on it? It isn't. Those two questions are exactly the same. Question, logically. So the answer is no, because it is not on the plot. Alternatively, <coughs> question six. I could say, please plot the point half, negative two. <coughs> Is this point in the graph? In which quadrant is point half negative two? Four. Quadrant four for those of you who know the quadrants by number. Using top, bottom, left, right. Where is it? So is this too subtle or is this too obvious? Or is it, or is it just a math class and really boring? <laughs> Which one? <laughs> because the thing is, is if you ever find yourself teaching and, and everyone's being quiet, that means that you're either going way too fast or way too slow. So which one? <laughs> and I can't tell. So which one is it? Well, okay, for the, for the quadrants, which quadrant is it in? Bottom right. Bottom right. Okay. Good. So here's the point. Um, th this, is, this one is the point uh, half, comma, negative two. <coughs> and uh, what's the answer <coughs> to the question I posed? Is it in the graph? So the answer is yes, <coughs> because it is on the plot. Now, if we ignore that for just a moment, ignore the drawing, and then I could put an entry in the table where x is half. And then I could say, what value of y do you need so that the corresponding point would be in the graph? which is to say plug in half for x. 2 times half is 1, minus 3 is negative 2, so we'd need to put a negative 2.
So the purpose of this page is to show you in the, that there's two very distinct ways to consider this question. Here's an equation in two variables. We can, we can consider it from a purely calculation point of view, and I could ask, is that point in the graph? Is that point in the graph? Here, all these points are in the graph. Okay. Or we can ask the same questions from a visual point of view. If you, if you had a plot. So, for example, I could just now, using your, because humans have a very advanced visual system, I could say, here's a point. Is that in the graph? No. What about that one? No. What about that one? Yes. yes. Right. So all the question, all of these questions, is it in the graph? If you have a plot, it's equivalent to asking, you know, am I touching the part that you drew? <coughs> okay, good. Any question about this? So we're going to be very interested in equations and two variables, and we're going to be very interested in their plots and their shapes will be quite important and we'll be able to answer questions that are kind of difficult from a calculation point of view but quite easy from a shape point of view and vice versa that it can be quite difficult I'm not really sure what the plot is shaped like I don't know but I can do a calculation and answer the question so for all the exercises that we're going to do I'm always going to try and illustrate both points of view the calculation point of view and the shape point of view. Good. Any question about this page? Okay. So, now, uh, that particular thing that we were looking at, uh, that particular plot we were looking at is a line. Okay, so now we're going to, we're going to really take a bite of that and we're going to consider all the possible lines. So what we're going to do, the way we're going to attack the situation, is um, we're going to break all the possibilities into categories. So the first category that we'll deal with is vertical lines. <coughs> so it has a picture. So there's my axis and then here's a particular vertical line so a line running straight up and down <clears throat> now I didn't draw tick marks so but let's say that I, I'm using my ruler and I say okay here's a point that is on the line and let's say that that happens to be the point uh, 3, 1. <coughs> Which is to say that from the origin you needed to travel 3 to the right and then 1 up to get there. Here's another point that is on the same line. <coughs> now, there's two coordinates, the, the horizontal and the vertical coordinate. So this point has its coordinates and that point has its coordinates. I claim that for this particular point, which you, we've not measured yet, you actually know one of its coordinates. Which coordinate do you know? You know the, the x coordinate. You know the horizontal coordinate. Why do you know the horizontal coordinate? Yeah, because it's a vertical line. Those all points on this line have to be lined up vertically, which is to say that without measuring at all, I know that it must be 3 comma something. It must be. So let's say that I finally get out my ruler and say, okay, vertically it, it happens to be um, 5. <coughs> so what I want you to observe is that we could move up and down on this line anywhere. We could go way, way high and then maybe we're at the point three comma million and then we can come way down here and be at three comma negative twelve but every 
horizontal coordinate for this particular line is going to be 3. As a result, as a result, the equation for this line is x equal 3. Which is to say, I'm talking about all <coughs> I'm talking about all of the xy values such that x is 3. So 3, 5 has the property that x is 3. 3, 1 has the property that x is 3. 3 million has the property that x is 3. These are the ones. <coughs> Any question about vertical lines? OK. Analogously, horizontal lines. <coughs> Okay, these are quite similar, except now they're running left and right. Okay, and, and again, I didn't draw tick marks, but let's say that I, I do have a ruler, and that I select this particular point, and I get out my ruler, and I measure this point to be, uh, say, 2, 2. two. Okay, and then I get interested and I come over here, say, and here, here's a new point on the same horizontal line. Now, we know that the coordinates here are 2, 2 because I got out my ruler and I measured it. And I claim that for this point, you know one of its coordinates. Which one do you know? We know the y coordinate. What must its y coordinate be? Two. Must be 2, which is to say that whatever the coordinates of this point are, it must be something, comma, 2. Must be something, comma, 2. And then let's say I get out my ruler and it turns out that it's 6, comma, 2. <coughs> Okay. So, does anyone care to speculate? What is the equation for this line? Y equals 2. Y equals 2. Which is to say, we want all of the xy values that have the property that y is 2. So, for example, the point million, comma 2, which is way over there, is on this line. And the point negative billion, comma 2, way over there, is also on this line. Any question about horizontal ones? So far, so good. Right? So the line y equal 100 to would be just like this one, except what? Higher. And the, the line x equal 73 would be just like this one, except further to the right. Okay. And finally, the kind of line that we're going to deal with is the kind that is neither vertical nor horizontal. And the name that we're going to give to these is sloped. And then this is going to be broken into two categories. And I'll explain why these two categories in a minute. So lines that are neither horizontal nor vertical. So for example, like this one. Or like this one. Okay. So now, the horizontal and vertical cases are pretty easy to deal with. Right? We, we literally have characterized already every single possible horizontal or vertical line. They all have the format at, in where equations are concerned, x <coughs> equals some constant or y equals some constant. So now the sloped variety, they're more interesting. They're going to require more work. So now that's what we're going to do on the next page to describe them.
Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to select two points. And they have to be different points. And the line between them must be a line which is sloped, not horizontal, not vertical. So now those are the two points I selected. Now I'm going to draw the line which passes through them. So now I'm going to select any other point that's not these two points. So any other point that is on the line that's not one of those two. Uh, so, for example, I'll select this one. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is just like when we were doing midpoints and distances and things like that, I'm going to drop the points down to the horizontal and vertical axes. So there's the horizontals. Let's say that we measure this to be x1, x2, and x3. So that's the horizontal measures. And then now say that we measure y1, y2, and y3. Okay. Now, in this particular setup, this is a right angle because we're using a rectangular coordinate system, so those are both right angles. And this is some, you know, some other angle. And what I'd like you to observe in this picture is that there's two triangles. There's two triangles. There's a big triangle, and there's a smaller triangle, triangle contained in the big one. So there's a big one and a contained little one. So these two triangles, taking them out of the picture and drawing them separately, looks something like this, so I'm drawing the big one. So that's the big one. Here's the little one. Not necessarily to scale. This is a right angle. This is a right angle. And notably, what I'd like for you to observe is that this angle right here and that angle right there are literally the same on this drawing. They're literally the same, which means that this angle right here for the big one is the same as this angle right here for the little one. They're the same. And then, given a triangle, once you have two angles, once you have two angles, you automatically have the third angle. And the reason is, is that the sum of all the angles of a triangle must sum up to a constant value. What constant value? 180 if you're using degrees, or pi if you're using radians. Which means that because here's two triangles that are not the same size, but they have two angles in common, that means that actually they have all three angles in common. So the big triangle and the little triangle are not the same triangle, but, and this is where I have to rely on the state of Texas who assures me that you've taken a geometry course, when you, <laughs> so we'll, we'll run with that. So, so when you have two triangles that have the same angles, those two triangles are said to be blank, said to be what? 
congruent means exactly the same. Right. Would mean same angles and same side lengths. What is it when you have two triangles that have the same angles but not necessarily the same <coughs> side lengths? It starts with S. Similar. So these are similar triangles. These are similar triangles. And another result from geometry is that analogous ratios of measures of similar triangles must be equivalent, which is a long-winded way to say the following. So in the drawing, what is the horizontal measure of the big triangle? X3 minus X1. X3 minus X1. And what is the vertical measure of the big triangle? Y3 minus Y1. And for the little triangle, what's the horizontal measure? X2 minus X1. X2 minus X1. Because there's the little triangle right there. And that's its horizontal measure. <coughs> and its vertical measure, Y2 minus Y1. And so, because these are similar triangles, that means that if we consider the ratio of the vertical measure divided by the horizontal measure, y3 minus y1 divided by x3 minus x1, for the big triangle, and we consider this, the analogous ratio for the little triangle, y2 minus y1, over x2 minus x1. So we're able to make those two measures. What must be true about this ratio and that ratio? What must be true about them? The best thing possible, the only thing possible. These two ratios must be the same. <clears throat> so I'd like to, for you to understand what that means. Remember the way that we, we made this drawing. I said, take any two points that when you draw a line <coughs> between them, you get a, slope, you, you get a sloped line, not a vertical one, not a horizontal one. This is what you get. So, you, so we said any two points. And then I said, now, now select any third point that's not the same as the previous two, but it's on the line. Now, I happen to select that one. But I could have selected that one. I could have selected one that was way out there. I could have selected one anywhere. It doesn't matter. And that's the thing about this. So that means that this property, this ratio, is an invariant property of the line. What's the name for that ratio? Slope. This ratio is called slope. Now, when people are doing mathematics on the street, <laughs> a guy can dream, right? This, uh, this is usually, these are given different names, right? This is usually called the rise. And what's the other one called? The run. Which is the origin of the phrase, slope is rise over run. So now, to finish the picture and to get us ready for Friday, I'm going to go back to this page here. This is where we were categorizing the kinds of lines. So for this particular case, and for these particular points that I, that I selected, what is the rise? The rise is how much you go up. So it would be 4. And what's the run for this one? How much do you go left and right? Zero. Zero. So what is the correct response if I were to ask, what is the slope of this line? Zero. 
it's undefined. Yeah. So here the slope is undefined because remember that slope is rise over run. So if this line had a slope, it would be 4 divided by 0. Is division by 0 defined? It is not. So the slope here is undefined. Similarly, what is the rise for this particular line? 0. And what is the run for this particular line? 4. And slope is rise over run. What is 0 divided by 4? Zero. So the slope of horizontal lines is zero. Now, if we do this, I know we're, we've got 10 seconds left, so let's get this finished. <laughs> so here, for this line, the run moving to the right would be some positive value because you're moving to the right. And then you're moving down, so the slope would be some negative value. I mean the the ru the run would rise. the rise would be a negative value. So rise over run would be a negative value over a positive value. So what's true about the slope? It must be negative. And finally, for this example, the run is some positive value. The rise is some positive value. So what would be true about the slope here? The slope is positive. And so on Friday, this is all the picture point of view of lines. On Friday, we're going to do the calculation point of view of lines. So see you on Friday.